Um, we're going to open the floor to questions, and we do have uh, microphones available so that you can ask. If you could pick two or three <laughs> policy prescriptions necessary to get the growth that Indonesia wants over the next 10 years, what would be those two or three recommendations you would have for a country like Indonesia? I think on macroeconomic policy, they've got some pretty good macroeconomic policy makers, so I don't worry about that. I think, uh, linked to what I just said about John, I think education, uh, there is a very basic need, uh, and particularly at the tertiary need, for considerable uh, efforts in education. And that's not something that's going to be able to influence the next few weeks, uh, but certainly the next... If they're really going to extract the demographic dividend, that's, in my opinion, number one. Number two, uh, linked to what I said about FDI, um, work on what is your what is your thing? What is it you've got to offer the world that nobody else has got away from commodities? Um, because if they don't, they will be forever dependent on the world commodity cycle uh, and, and the Fed's monetary policy. So. And the third thing that goes with it, it is it's a very young country in terms of democracy, arguably only since 98 in some ways. And, and, and I think more self-confidence in, and, and, in the governance of its organisations, which ties probably to the, some aspects of the corruption issue, I think that's a, a pretty important thing as well. Please. I, I want to add. Uh, look, I mean, if you, if you take a look at our trade account, I think it tells you the full picture. We import too much oil. We import, I mean, that's what's causing the, the trade deficit and the current account deficit. The game change is in the oil industry. If we can produce more than uh, the 830,000 barrels a day worth of production to fulfill the 1.3 million barrels a day demand. And we've got enough wells and deposits to fulfill that. The second is the low-hanging fruits of manufacturing products, which we import so many and so much of from China and the other Asian countries. These are stuff that I think Indonesian high school graduates and polytechnics can make. And all it does require is a set of fiscal uh, incentives, which I think the government could pretty easily figure out, which we've tried, we've done uh, since two years ago. We've, we've started giving out tax holidays and tax allowances. And, and, and the third is really corruption. Corruption, I think, takes 1% to 2% of our growth. All we got to do is improve the ratio of the investigators to the public officials. The ratio of the investigators to the public officials is 100 investigators to 4.5 public officials in a country. So that's 1 to 45,000. Hong Kong took 30 years to eradicate corruption, and they had a ratio of 1 to 200 in terms of the number of investigators to the number of public officials. And this requires fiscal thinking. And I think we can afford the last bit. It's, it's the fiscal space that we can create a lot more of. There's only 20 million people and companies paying taxes. There's a lot of people hiding in the bushes that are not paying taxes. So we can do something about that. Is there an empty bush I can go hide behind? Well, no, <laughs> no, I wasn't suggesting anything to you, Ron. But, but I, we can quite easily improve our tax ratio 15.5% to perhaps 20%. If we can do that, we would have a lot more fiscal space to get a lot more people to get PhDs, masters, bachelor's degrees, and what have you. That would be our long-term game plan. But the short and midterm, I think it's very clear. We just got to make motorcycles in Indonesia and handphones in Indonesia. There's 250 million people that will demand them. Jean-Claude, if, if a President Gita were to call you and say, <laughs> what do we need to do on the monetary of Lipo? For the monetary policy, I would say you would not, not be surprised. Be sound and reasonable. Know that you have to anchor solidly your inflation expectations. And it is true for the advanced economy as well as for the emerging world. And if you stabilize your inflation expectations, medium and long run, you are really helping even much more than you think uh, growth, sustainable growth in the country. And let me say, uh, conclude on that, what has happened under the crisis in the advanced economy has not been observed sufficiently. All countries that are uh, issuing the currencies of the SDR have now the same definition of price stability. We say less than two, but close to two. The US has said in 2012, 
2%. Japan has said in 2013, 2%, and the UK is in a monetary targeting at 2%. All currencies of the SDR, 2%, which says a lot also on the help they think will be associated with stabilizing the long-term, medium-term uh, inflation expectations in order to avoid uh, the deflation, which is a danger, obviously, in, uh, as well as inflation, of course, in the longer run. But uh, again, sound monetary policy are of the essence, sir. Right. Uh, Jean-Claude, I can't, I can't resist one. Does that mean for, for China to become part of the SDR, they have to adopt a 2% inflation target? We will see when time comes. <laughs> there, there are a number of other conditions for, for China to join the club. But, uh, I mean, it would be something like, uh, you know, 4%. One, of this, uh, <laughs> one of these criteria you could imagine. Second, we'll get your microphone so that you can be heard. Zubin said that over 50 years uh, from 62 till 2013, and this is question is addressed to you, Jim. The Latin American countries uh, have not made any progress with their per capita as a percentage of the U.S. Okay. It has stayed flat at around 25 percent. But in Asia, the emerging markets, uh, the countries have gone from about 12% to about 40% of uh, American uh, per capita GDP. What do you think explains this great variation? Well, I don't think, if, if there's anybody from Chile in the room, I don't think uh, all Latin, Latin American people would be, would be in agreement with that. Ch Chile has made yeah. considerable progress in the past 20 but years. You just took it as a whole club, you know, all of Asia and all of Latin America. I mean, personally, I, there's a lot of really good things going on in Latin America, other than Argentina and, and maybe aspects of Venezuela. There's a lot of very good things going on in Latin America, in my opinion. Mexico, Colombia, Chile, kind of Brazil, kind of, not quite as good as it was. But, and Brazil, by the way, has made quite a bit of progress on and one of the reasons why Lula was so popular because uh, he, he raised uh, wealth for so many poor people. Uh, I often thought he was the most successful G20 policymaker of the past decade because of how many people he helped take out of poverty in Brazil. However, uh, it is true, uh, but in that sense, uh, I'll answer you in a slightly indirect way. I, I, I have often said, and I've discussed it with these guys and some of their colleagues, that South Korea, in my opinion, is, is, a, is if not a role model, a real example for every major developing country to, to get on a plane to and go and spend some time. Because they are the only country of more than 40 million people in my lifetime that has taken its wealth to that of a G7 or close to, close to Italy and Spain. Uh, and there must be something about that uh, which relates to policy. And, and some things I used to, I still work on developing a new version of what, what I did at Goldman. It's sort, of, it's sort of a scoring system of 18 variables for productivity. South Korea is in the top 10 countries in the world on things like that. And education, use, use of technology, and openness to trade are the three things which I think many other emerging countries can learn from whether it be Latin America or, or elsewhere. And that's one of the reasons, I think, why Chile is starting to do quite a bit better. Yes, Jean -Claude. No, on, only to, to, I have rescheduled all Latin America countries in the 80s as chairman of the Paris Club. And I have to confirm what Jim was saying. The progress which were made there are really extraordinary. And we are not foreseen at all. The, the Mexican you know, growth is striking. And I think that, uh, of course, well, the figures which were mentioned are not false. Uh, but we, yeah, one has to take into account that China and India, which are absolutely gigantic, and perhaps other countries, we are starting from a much lower level 
than the uh, Latin America. So I, I really trust that you have to nuance a little bit. And of course, in Latin America, you have also very bad stories like uh, Argentina. But uh, again, Chile, Mexico, and Brazil, in many respects, are success stories, which are very impressive. Minister Mahindra, with, with respect to Latin America, in the United States up until maybe the 1990s, people referred to the region as having infinite potential and always would have. Uh, and, and, and how does the East, uh, particularly Southeast Asia, avoid that kind of same characterization? I mean, obviously, there's been a great deal of growth, but there is the question of where it caps out or whether or not it continues on in, in a meaningful and sustainable way. The different answer uh, to the uh, Asia or... Uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia story and Latin America is that uh, for East Asia and Southeast Asia story, uh, the sustainability scenario lies on its own region and domestic market, while in Latin America probably is proximity to the U.S. And this is why I think uh, Asia will become even more important. Now we already contribute to 50% of uh, GDP. But if he uh, goes further, what also happened is that we contribute uh, to uh, about two-thirds of uh, exports uh, and uh, overall international trade, which means uh, on one hand that is good, but on the other hand it is sensitive and it is not sustainable to uh, repeat the example of the uh, pre lehman uh, crisis where everything was exported to the advanced economies. Advanced economies, despite a cyclical growth of 2%, 3%, is by definition a saturated mature market. While Asia, as I thought earlier, is an issue of 110% increase of a middle income group between eight years. So we have the much more sustainable growth story within Asia, and this is the issue of intra-regional and domestic consumption. And this is where I think every Asian nation try to adjust their uh, old China, old uh, U.S. story to the new China, U new uh, U.S. stories, uh, where consumption will become uh, more important and intra-regional openness, uh, trade and investment will become uh, the, the determining factor. So as, as you look forward over the next year, the things that keep you up at night, you know, the, these are the types of things that, you know, we, maybe we've touched on, maybe we haven't. But the things that you worry about most with respect to sustaining economic growth, to creating structural reforms, and then also what you worry about in other parts of the world, where, where is your mind most focused these days? Jim picked up on South Korea. Uh, let's, let's not forget, South Korea was not one of the most open economies in the early 70s. They had the advantage of not being a WTO member at that time. Uh, but they, they did a lot of things right. And, and what the first thing that they did was to basically come out with an agrarian law. Uh, and that's what Japan did, what Taiwan did, and China did. And this is something that I think Indonesia needs to do firsthand. We got to make sure that we can put food on the table for ourselves. And, 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 you know, there's, there's been an increasing amount of uh, importation of agricultural products uh, into Indonesia. And, and this is something that I think we need to take a view on. And number two, we need to make sure and ensure the farmers that uh, they have the ability to cultivate the land uh, for themselves, uh, for their kids and grandkids, so that it's not going to be built malls on and golf courses and whatever. Uh, we have more than 40 million farmers in Indonesia. And, and I think when we're talking about food, uh, it's not just about food security. It's, it's more about food sovereignty. You know, the fertility of our land, I think, is, is enough uh, you know, for, for us to believe that we can achieve that. Now, when we achieve that, then we can start thinking of ourselves as an industrial country. Uh, now we have to start from the basics, uh, the basic stuff that we talked about earlier before we get into the high-tech uh, stuff that what China, Taiwan, and Japan are already doing, or South Korea. So agrarian, I think, is, is, is uh, really a, a, a top uh, priority for, for you know, me and hopefully for most Indonesians. Minister Mahendra, with respect to that, I mean, the, 
there, there are agricultural powerhouses in the world that think quite differently than Minister Gita. They want to export, whether it's you know, gen genetically modified foods that are developed in the United States, may or may not have some resonance in other parts of the world. But this issue of farming has been actually you know, debated globally since the 1980s. I remember in 1986, before the WTO at the GATT, we were talking about subsidies, we were talking about deals, and yet there is really no comprehensive global uh, uh, situation that addresses agriculture? Is, is, it, is, is it partly also incumbent upon the rest of the world to work some of these problems out before you can uh, become fully self-sufficient at home in that regard? Yes, I think um, it's very clear. Uh, on one hand, every uh, nation would like to have a uh, food security uh, strategy and their priority. Uh, but then uh, if you put the overall uh, international trade uh, and investment uh, picture into it, then of course uh, it is very uh, 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 challenging uh, to have uh, individual uh, food security issue and overall uh, global uh, food security situation. I think uh, within, again, uh, we have to change uh, the mindset uh, that in the past uh, what happened is that uh, emerging economies, developing countries, uh, part of the uh, food uh, value chain is always from the uh, production side and then uh, when uh, farmers produce it, and then export it raw, and then, of course, expect uh, the prices would uh, improve. But what happened is always uh, the story of uh, high risk volatility of prices, because they are in the uh, uh, worst part of the equation, uh, while, of course, the consumers uh, from the advanced markets would dictate uh, the prices volatility according to the business cycle. But again, this, is, this ha doesn't have to be uh, the story permanently. We have the potential to uh, develop our own story where the whole value chain uh, will take place uh, in uh, the country and in the region where we can uh, hopefully uh, rewrite the history much better than the rest of the story that we know very much how uh, subsidy played uh, the whole uh, situation of uh, agriculture in many countries, uh, not to mention this region uh, creates uh, disturbances and distortions. And I think. This is where uh, the lesson learned of the old world, uh, if I can say, instead of just the old US, the old world story, uh, to put it into the new world story in a much better frame. Jim, um, with respect to the next year, if we were to reconvene the same panel 12 months from now, what do you think we'd be talking about compared to today? I hope uh, relates to the sort of three issues that concern me and my general optimism, I hope we would not be talking about the following three. Um, but whilst it's easy for China to reduce the importance of the old China, to create the new China requires delivering on a lot of really good things to say. So I, I hope we see some evidence of, of that actually appearing more this year. Um, secondly, I don't like the tone of some of the comments going on across the waters between them and Japan. I assume that the importance of the economic relationship is such that it starts them getting a bit too emotional. Uh, and then thirdly, actually, uh, something for Jean-Claude to focus on. I, I worry um, about his old job and his, uh, his uh, successor. ECB has an inflation target of just below 2%. Given the challenges facing some of the periphery, they are only going to be able to succeed in reaching that if Germany somehow can accept inflation going above 2%. It bothers me that there's something in the German psyche that they can't. With respect to that, uh, Christine Lagarde in the last week has suggested that still the biggest threat to the global economy, particularly the developed global economy, is deflation. Is that something with which you agree, and, and is there more work to be done on that front? I think it is one of the threats. I'm not sure that it is the only one, obviously. Uh, but on that particular point, I would say, first of all, during all the crisis, there has been 
threats of materialization of a deflationary risk in the United States when you look at the inflation expectations, they were at cert certain time below zero. Uh, in the case of Europe, fortunately, even if we went down and up and down, uh, we never, never lost the anchoring of inflation expectations. I'm back to what I said, it's extremely important to be solidly anchored. It's very good that the central banks have been clear in saying we have on the one hand the liquidity measures and on the other hand the interest rate policy. I always was an advo a strong advocate of separating the two instruments because if you join the two, then you risk that the start of tapering would increase the market interest rates dramatically or the reverse. Uh, you have to uh, continue to have a separate handling of both, in my opinion, and uh, it is more or less what is accepted by the market now, because I see tapering going on and the interest rates uh, not being influenced now. I mean, it's, it was a painful exercise, but it's done and it's good. All right. Please join me in thanking Jim O'Neill, Minister Mahendra, Minister Gita, Jean-Claude Trichet. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. I think the important thing is to make sure that these economies grow in a sustainable way. The main challenge right now is that we've got to figure out a way to create more job growth uh, for the lower and middle class. And I think this is going to be a huge challenge for Asia, as it is, frankly, in the United States. There is an impact on the tapering off to the emerging market. But on the other hand, with the improvement of the U.S. economy, this will also boost our export. So the most important one, as I said to you, that how the emerging market do their homework um, regarding this improvement on the supply side, like infrastructure, you know, uh, is doing business, improvement of the investment climate. The biggest challenge for Indonesian government that need um, to be addressed, I think they uh, need to come out with um, very firm um, regulation. So people are concerned when they investing um, 100 million billion of dollar into the, the, um, the industry. Uh, without um, a structural reform, I think um, Indonesia will continue to be lag behind.